Introduction This is a story of the 12-year career of a CIA secret operations officer that ended in early 1969. It is an attempt to open another small window to the kinds of secret activities that the U.S. government undertakes through the CIA in third world countries in the name of U.S. national security. It includes the actual people and organizations involved, placed within the political, economic, and social context in which the activities occurred. An attempt is also made to include my personal interpretation of what I was doing and to show the effect of this work on my family life. My reasons for revealing these activities will be found in the text. No one, of course, can remember in detail all the events of a 12-year period of his life. In order to write this book, I have spent most of the last four years in intensive research to reinforce my own recollections. The officers of a CIA station abroad work as a team, often in quite different activities and with a considerable number of indigenous agents and collaborators. I have tried to describe the overall team effort, not just my own role, because all the station's efforts relate to the same goals. The variety of operations that are undertaken simultaneously by a single officer and by the station team made an ordinary narrative presentation cumbersome. I have chosen a diary format, written, to be sure, in 1973 and 1974, in order to show the progressive development of different activities and to convey a sense of actuality. This method also has defects, requiring the reader to follow many different strands from one entry in the diary to another, but I believe it is the most effective method for showing what we did. In order to ease the problem of remembering who all the characters are, I have included a special appendix, Appendix 1, which has descriptions of individuals and organizations involved or connected with the agency or its operations, see note to Appendix 1. The reader is directed to this appendix by the use of a double dagger, in the text. It will be noted that many agents' names have been forgotten and that only cryptonyms, code names, can be given. Some of the original cryptonyms have also been forgotten, and in these cases I have composed new ones in order to refer to a real person by some name at least. Appendix 2 gives an alphabetical listing of all abbreviations used and an asterisk indicates those entries which appear in Appendix 1. Several of the operational activities that I describe could not be placed at the exact date they really happened, for lack of research materials, but they are placed as close as possible to the date they occurred with no loss or distortion of meaning. Similarly, several events have been shifted a day or two so that they could be included in diary entries just before or just after they actually occurred. In these cases the changes make no difference. When I joined the CIA I believed in the need for its existence. After 12 years with the agency I finally understood how much suffering it was causing, that millions of people all over the world had been killed or had had their lives destroyed by the CIA and the institutions it supports. I couldn't sit by and do nothing and so began work on this book. Even after recent revelations about the CIA it is still difficult for people to understand what a huge and sinister organization the CIA is. It is the biggest and most powerful secret service that has ever existed. I don't know how big the KGB is inside the Soviet Union, but its international operation is small compared with the CIA's. The CIA has 16,500 employees and an annual budget of $750 million. That does not include its mercenary armies or its commercial subsidiaries. Add them all together, the agency employs or subsidizes hundreds of thousands of people and spends billions every year. Its official budget is secret, it's concealed in those of other federal agencies. Nobody tells the Congress what the CIA spends. By jaw, the CIA is not accountable to Congress. In the past 25 years, the CIA has been involved in plots to overthrow governments in Iran, the Sudan, Syria, Guatemala, Ecuador, Guyana, Zaire, and Ghana. In Greece, the CIA participated in bringing in the repressive regime of the colonels. In Chile, the company spent millions to destabilize the Allende government and set up the military junta, which has since massacred tens of thousands of workers, students, liberals, and leftists. In Indonesia in 1965, the company was behind an even bloodier coup, 
the one that got rid of Sukarno and led to the slaughter of at least 500,000 and possibly 1 million people. In the Dominican Republic the CIA arranged the assassination of the dictator Rafael Trujillo and later participated in the invasion that prevented the return to power of the liberal ex-president Juan Bosch. In Cuba, the company paid for and directed the invasion that failed at the Bay of Pigs. Some time later the CIA was involved in attempts to assassinate Fidel Castro. It is difficult to believe, or comprehend, that the CIA could be involved in all these subversive activities all over the world. The life of a CIA operations officer can be exciting, romantic. You belong to a special club, the company. For most of my career with the CIA I felt that I was doing something worthwhile. There is not much time to think about the results of your actions and, if you try to do it well, the job of operations officer calls for dedication to the point of obsession. But it's a schizophrenic sort of situation. You have too many secrets, you can't relax with outsiders. Sometimes an operative uses several identities at once. If somebody asks you a simple question, what did you do over the weekend? Your mind goes click. Who does he think I am? What would the guy he thinks I am be doing over the weekend? You get so used to lying that after a while it's hard to remember what the truth is. When I joined the CIA I signed the secrecy agreement. With this book, articles, exposure on radio and television, I may have violated that agreement. I believe it is worse to stay silent, that the agreement itself was immoral. My experience with the CIA has mostly been with its overseas operations. I trust investigations now going on in Washington into CIA activities will also expose CIA internal involvement which is, I suspect, much greater than anybody outside the CIA knows or the National Security Council realizes. I believe a lot of sinister things will come out and that Americans may be in for some very severe shocks. In the New York Review of Books of December 30, 1971, Richard Helms, then CIA director, was quoted from a rare address to the National Press Club. In justifying the CIA's secret operations, he said, you've just got to trust us. We are honorable men. I ask that these words be remembered while reading this book, together with the fact that CIA operations are undertaken on instructions from the president himself and are approved in very detailed form on various levels within the CIA, and often at the undersecretary level or higher outside the agency. Finally, I ask that it be kept in mind that the kinds of operations I describe, which occurred for the most part in Latin America, were typical of those undertaken in countries of the Far East, Near East, and Africa. I would also suggest that they are continuing today. Revelations during the past year of the CIA's destabilization program against the Allende government in Chile, its illegal domestic operations and its complicity in political assassinations or assassination attempts have finally precipitated a long overdue debate. I hope this book will contribute to it. London, May 1975 Inside the Company CIA Diary Part 1 South Bend, Indiana, April 1956 Hundreds of companies come to the university to interview students for possible employment. I hadn't signed up for any interviews but I've just had my first, and probably only, job interview. To my surprise a man from the CIA came out from Washington to see me about going into a secret junior executive training program. Virginia Pilgrim must have recommended me. I'd forgotten she mentioned a program like this when she stayed with us in Tampa last year, said she would dearly love to see the son of her oldest friends come into the CIA. Somehow I have the impression she is one of the highest ranking women in the CIA, worked on the Clark Task Force that investigated the CIA under the Hoover Commission. I told Gus, the recruiter, that I had already been accepted for law study. He was surprised. Virginia didn't know my plans. He said the JOT, junior officer trainee, program consists of six to nine months, in some cases even a year of increasingly specialized training on the graduate school level. After the course you begin CIA work on analysis, research, special studies, and reports writing, administration or secret operations. 
he said he couldn't say much about the course or the work because it is all classified. Gus asked me about my military service situation and when I told him I would have to do it sooner or later he mentioned a possible combination. For Jots who haven't done military service the CIA arranges to take a special course in the Army or the Air Force, which is really controlled by the CIA. It takes about a year to get an officer's commission and then you have to serve a year on a military assignment. Then it's back to Washington for the JOT training program and finally assignment to a job at CIA headquarters in Washington. According to his calculations it would take five or six years to be assigned overseas if I wanted to go into secret operations. Too long to wait before getting to the good part, I thought. Gus knew a lot about me, student government, academic honors, and the rest. I said that what I liked best was being chairman of the Washington's birthday exercises in February when we gave the Patriotism Award to General Curtis LeMay. I told Gus that the exercises are the most important expression of the country part of the Notre Dame motto, for God, country, and Notre Dame. He said I should keep the CIA in mind if I changed my plans. I would consider the CIA if the military combination worked but Gus emphasized that they only want people prepared for a career in the CIA. That leaves me out. I suppose the CIA works closely with General LeMay and his strategic air command. This is the most important part of the speech he gave at the exercises, our patriotism must be intelligent patriotism. It has to go deeper than blind nationalism or shallow emotional patriotic fervour. We must continually study and understand the shifting tides of our world environment. Out of this understanding we must arrive at sound moral conclusions. And we must see to it that these conclusions are reflected in our public policies. If we maintain our faith in God, our love of freedom, and superior global air power, I think we can look to the future with confidence. Tampa, Florida, June 1956 it's a strange feeling being back in Florida for the summer with no plans to return to the cold north in the fall. The miserable weather and the long distance from home and all the other negative aspects of studying at Notre Dame seem to fade away during commencement weekend. No more bed check or lights out at midnight. No more compulsory mass attendance and evening curfew. No more religious bulletin to make you feel guilty if you didn't attend a novena, benediction, or rosary service and no more fear of expulsion for driving a car in South Bend. The end has come to, I hope, to the loneliness and frustration of living in an all-male institution isolated from female company. What will it be like to live without the religion and discipline of the university? It may have been hard but they were teaching us how to live the virtuous life of a good Catholic. Even so, I still have this constant fear that after all I might die by accident with a mortal sin on my soul. Eternity in hell is a worry I can't seem to shake off. But the main thing is to keep on trying, not to give up. After having to take all those courses on religion the only person to blame, if I really don't make it, will be me. It is the discipline and religion that makes Notre Dame men different, and after four years of training I ought to be able to do better. Admiral R. Lee Burke, Chief of Naval Operations, discussed this in his speech at the graduation ceremony. He really impressed me, Notre Dame symbolizes many virtues. It blends the virtues of religion and patriotism, service to God, service to country. Notre Dame stands for faith, faith in self and faith in country. Self-discipline and determination and fighting spirit are an integral part of the curriculum. We are living in a great country where there is equality of opportunity, where justice is a reality. We are a generous nation. We will never wage a war of aggression. We are a strong nation. We have strong allies. But greater than all this strength is the strength of our moral principles. Our nation is the symbol of freedom, of justice, and opportunity, regardless of flag or political beliefs. Communism has been, and still is, a prison for the millions who are denied the opportunity to learn responsibility, who are compelled to let the few do the thinking for the many who will do the labor. Should we relax our efforts, either spiritual or physical, we would find our ship without a rudder, we would find our strength not sufficient to cope with the strong adverse winds which at some time will confront us. 
It takes a man with strength and a stout heart to steer in a gale. Admiral Burke writes a great speech, couldn't have been more accurate or more inspiring. At Notre Dame we learned how one's responsibilities extend beyond oneself to family, community, and nation, and that respect for authority is the virtue of a respectable citizen. I will be driving a truck this summer to earn money for law school in the fall. Tampa, Florida December 1956 Studying law at the University of Florida was a mistake. I didn't feel I belonged, I wasn't comfortable, in the fraternity world and the Hale Fellow routine. But I'm not an ascetic either. I suppose it was the lack of a sense of purpose or maybe I couldn't adjust to secular learning after four years of Jesuits and four at Notre Dame. At least I did realize it, and only stayed three months. I checked with the draft board and they said I have about six months before I'll be called up. It's a sad prospect, two years wasted as a private, washing dishes and peeling potatoes. For a few months anyway I'll live with my parents in Florida and try to save some money. A draftee only makes about $80 a month and that's hardly enough for booze and cigarettes. The problem is what to do about the business. My father and grandfather are just starting a big expansion and they're counting on me to take my place with them. I know I'll make a lot of money but I can't get enthusiastic about it. Why the reluctance to go into a family business? When I switched to philosophy studies after a year of business administration at Notre Dame I thought I was doing it for the sake of a higher form of education. Like so many others I could learn to run a business once I got into it. Well now I'm in it and I feel the same as when I rejected business administration for philosophy. I wish I could speak to my father or grandfather about it but it would look as if I think I'm too good for something they've dedicated their lives to. No hasty decisions. I've got six months to work with them and then two years in the army. Tampa, Florida, February 1957. There has got to be a way to avoid two lost years in the army. I've written to the CIA, reminding them of my meeting with Gus, and asking to be reconsidered. I've received application forms, returned them, advised Virginia Pilgrim by telephone, and now have to wait. Virginia said her friends in the personnel department would process my application as fast as possible because of the problem of the draft but it looks as if I may be too late. She said the security clearance takes about six months so the draft will probably win. Gus said the JOT program is strictly for people who want to make the CIA a career and I've been wondering about this. No way to know until I learn more about what CIA work is like, but I really am interested in politics and international relations. And the more I live here the less enthusiastic I get for a lifetime in the family business. We'll see what kind of alternative the CIA can provide. It will mean three years military duty instead of two if they take me, but I'll be an officer, more pay, better work, especially at the CIA, and time to decide. Washington DC April 1957 I've been called to Washington for an interview with the JOT office which is in quarters I near the Potomac River. I waited in a reception room until a secretary came for me, filled out a visitor's pass form giving name, address and purpose of visit, and the receptionist added the hour and stamped in large letters must be accompanied. Then she gave me a plastic clip-on badge which I had to wear at all times. The secretary signed as responsible for me and I followed her to the JOT office. The man who interviewed me is named Jim Ferguson. We spent about a half hour discussing Notre Dame, the family business and my interest in a career in foreign affairs. I remembered the conversation with Gus and emphasized that while I am interested in a CIA career I know so little about the agency that my reasons are necessarily restricted to an interest in foreign affairs. He said that they had arranged a series of tests and interviews with officers in charge of the JOT program, including Dr. Ecclesiastes, the program director. If the testing and interviews go well a complete security background investigation will be made, which could take about six months. But in my case, with the problem of the draft, they could ask for priority action and hope for the best. The secretary gave me a piece of plain white paper with the building names, offices, and times I was to report for the testing, it would take three days in all. She explained that at each building I would have to report to the receptionist, 
who would call the office where I had the appointment for someone to come and sign me in. She also reminded me to wear the visitor's badge at all times in the buildings and to return it with the pink visitor's pass on leaving. I would use the shuttle, an exclusive agency bus, to get around the different buildings. During that first visit to the JOT office, I immediately sensed the fraternal identification among the CIA people. I suppose it was partly because they used a special inside language. No one spoke of CIA, Central Intelligence Agency, or even the agency. Every reference to the agency used the word company. My first appointment was at the North Building with the medical staff and after that I alternated between those people and the office called the Assessment and Evaluation in the Recreation and Services Building on Ohio Drive. Although it seemed that the medical staff were looking for physical and mental health, and that A&E were looking for the special qualities needed in an intelligence operative, there seemed to be little distinction between them. It was exhausting, endless hours filling in answer sheets to vocational, aptitude and personality tests. I've read of the elaborate testing procedures developed by the Office of Strategic Services during World War II and now one see it's still going on. Stanford, Minnesota, Strong, Wexler, Guilford, Cuter, Rorschach, some tests are administered and others just written. The worst was the interview with the psychiatrist at the medical staff, he really bugged me. I finally finished about noon on the afternoon of the third day, and I had a couple of hours before I had to report back to the JOT office so I decided to do some sightseeing. I grabbed a sandwich at a blind stand and then took the shuttle to the executive office building. Those blind stands, sandwich bars operated by blind people, are in practically every building. I guess it's a good thing for the blind people to have that work, and the company can let them in the buildings because they can't read secret papers. Everybody wins. Then out to the Washington Monument. Looking out from the top of the monument at the buildings where our national life is guided, where our integrity in the face of grave external threat is defended, and where the plurality of conflicting domestic interests finds harmony, I admitted to myself that participation in government is my long-range goal. It won't matter if I live below my parents' material level or even without fixed roots in a community. Working in the Central Intelligence Agency, preferably overseas, with intimate knowledge of the functioning and decisions of friendly and hostile governments will provide a forever stimulating and exciting atmosphere as well as an intellectually challenging occupation. I'll be a warrior against communist subversive erosion of freedom and personal liberties around the world, a patriot dedicated to the preservation of my country and our way of life. I left the monument through the circle of American flags and walked back to quarters I feeling more confident and self-possessed than at any time since arriving. After the usual sign-in, pink slip, badge, and escort procedure, I was received again by Ferguson who told me the first reports on the testing looked pretty good. While waiting to see Dr. Ecclesiastes, Ferguson said he would brief me on the military program they had in mind. First, however, he warned me that the program was classified and not to be discussed with anyone outside the agency. At his request I signed a statement acknowledging that what I learned was information relating to national security and promising that I would not reveal it. Ferguson outlined the military program. When the security clearance is completed I will be called back to Washington where I will enlist in the Air Force. After three months basic training I will be assigned to the first available class at Officer Candidate School, all at Lackland Air Force Base in San Antonio, Texas. Following OCS I will be assigned to an Air Force Base somewhere in the U.S., and, with luck, my duties will be in air intelligence. Ferguson explained that the company doesn't control assignments made by the Air Force after completion of OCS, but more and more of the company military trainees are getting intelligence assignments during the obligatory year of strictly military duties. After a year at the Air Force Base I will be transferred to an Air Force unit in Washington that is actually a company cover unit, and my formal company training will begin. The secretary appeared and said Dr. Ecclesiastes would see me. I still had to get past him and I had primed myself for this meeting. Virginia had told me that Dr. Ecclesiastes's approval was necessary for acceptance. He turned out to be a bushy-browed, 
bespectacled man of about sixty with an unavoidable authoritative glare. He asked me why I wanted to be an intelligence officer and when I replied that foreign affairs is one of my main interests he tried to make me uncomfortable. He said that foreign policy is for diplomats, intelligence officers only collect information and pass it to others for policy making. He added that maybe I should try the State Department. I said maybe I should but that I don't know enough about the agency yet to decide, adding that I'd like to come into the program to see. He then gave me a little lecture, they don't want men who will quit the CIA as soon as they finish military service. They want only men who will be career intelligence officers. After that he turned into a kind old grandfather and said we'd see how the security clearance turned out. He shook my hand and said they'd like to have me. Made it? I'm in, but it seems too easy. Back in Ferguson's office where he continued to describe the program. At no time will I be connected openly with the company, and I am to tell no one that I am being considered by it for employment. Assuming the security investigation is favorable, they will arrange for me to be hired as a civilian by the Department of the Air Force, actually by an Air Force cover unit of the company, when I am called back to Washington. A few weeks later I will enlist in the Air Force and be sent to Lackland for basic training. While in the Air Force I will be treated just like any other enlistee and no one will know of my company connection. Keeping the secret will be part of my training, learning to live my cover. A violation of cover could lead to dismissal from the program. My assignments afterwards will also be determined in part by how well I have concealed my company affiliation. Back in Florida I must keep the plan secret, but notify Ferguson if I receive any orders from the draft board. I'm beginning to feel a kind of satisfaction in having a secret and of being on the threshold of an exclusive club with a very select membership. I am going to be my own kind of snob. Inside the agency I'll be a real and honest person. To everyone outside I'll have a secret lie about who and what I am. My secret life has begun. Washington, D.C., July 1957. Salvation. The security clearance ended before the call-up came, and I drove to Washington loaded with books, hi-fi, records and tennis gear. Georgetown is the an area where a CIA officer trainee feels most comfortable, so I've moved in with some former Notre Dame classmates who are doing graduate study at Georgetown University. We're living in a restored Federalist house on Cherry Hill Lane, a narrow brick street between M Street and the Chesapeake and Ohio Canal. I have that feeling of being just the right person in just the right place. These friends don't know I'm going into the CIA so this will be my first real test of living a cover. At the JOT office Ferguson told me whom I am working for. My employer is the Department of the Air Force, Headquarters Command, Research and Analysis Group, Balling Air Force Base.